I haven't led a webinar like this before in meeting mode, period. Is there anything else I need to know? Question mark. Hey, <laughs> sorry. I was just really, I, I was unex, unexpected. <laughs> um, so do I unclick, <clears throat> sorry, unclick allow participants to unmute themselves? Sorry, I can't hear you breaking up. Yeah, call me back in one minute, that's fine.
Hey. Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, I want to disable. Wait, I don't know if I don't know if I'm starting with the screen share. Well, I don't know. I got to ask her because it sounds like there's an intro that just says, thanks for inviting me, how we'll spend our time together. But I don't know if that's for, I don't know if that's like a heads up before the outline or if that's what she's actually saying. I will, I will, yeah. Yeah, I, I see where it is. I know, I see where it is. But wait, so am I, is that make it so people can just automatically get in? Okay. Okay. Do I have to do them individually or do, is there a button that just lets everyone in from waiting room? Okay. Okay. All right, hold on one sec. Um, I think it's just one lady teaching cooking. Okay. But they can change it if they want, since it's a meeting, right? Okay. Um, and then, what was I going to say? I think that's right. So wait, Stephanie, that's, I'm not sure the P, I don't know who's actually going to introduce her. Is it Stephanie? Okay, that's fine. All right. Cool. Sorry, I was just confused at first. I was like, uh oh, because it said starting meeting, and I was like, oh no. Okay. No worries. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, sounds good. All right, talk to you later. All right, bye. Hello. Are you on mute? <laughs> Hello. Oh, still on mute. <laughs> Hmm. 
Oh. Hello. There we go. Okay. There we go. Hello. It was Sorry. telling me the host wasn't allowing you to unmute. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I have to make you co host because this oh. is in meeting mode. I've made it so that participants can't unmute themselves. Let me make you a co host right now. So, actually, okay. that was one thing I need to ask is um, who is going to be part of the event? Like, who should I make co host? Obviously, Laura, you. Is there anyone else from Toledo? Um, if Renee joins us, okay, I actually had a question mark by her. Okay. And, um, like, are you giving an introduction? No. And now I'm drawing a blank on who is giving the introduction. Hang on a second. Let me no worries. go into my, go and I into saw like on her, well, I'll ask Laura once she's here. Cause I uh -huh. saw she has this little intro before the video, but I couldn't tell if the intro was for us just telling us what, what she's going to do, or if she's really going to talk before the first video, I wasn't sure. Sue. Oh, okay. So S Sue doesn't need to be a co-host. She's doing the introduction. Oh, then she does. Just it'll so, make it easier because I'm going to admit her. Anyone who we need to do a tech check with, okay. I want to um, make a co-host because that okay. way they can mute and unmute themselves. Okay. And I know who is supposed to be in before the meeting starts. Oh, okay. okay. And also, um, since I will be screen sharing a video either at the way beginning or pretty much the beginning, mm -hmm. while I'm screen sharing, I can't admit people. So if someone that's fine because I got to take attendance anyways. Oh, before we even start. Yeah. Okay. So, so then, all right. As perfect. they as they show up, I'm gonna cross them off my list and then I'm going to admit them. Great. Perfect. This is a good day for her to be reading or talking about a book about women's suffrage. Know. Works out very well. I know. So exciting. So I think now you could even, you can admit people, like I was saying. Okay. So if someone shows up, then we're good. You know, I actually might run to the restroom really quickly. If someone okay. comes in it's that you fine. know, just tell them I'll be right back. I'm just going to okay. mute myself for one sec. Well, you know what? You don't.
I know it stresses her out, so. You two are screwed. So how are you doing? You having a good day? Good, yeah. This morning went well, so. Oh, good. Yeah, like, I Whoo. talked to Jake for a second. Who um who did you guys have? Uh, we had Gabrielle Savit, Ruth Behar, Brianna Kaplan Sayers, and Casey Breton. Very nice. Ruth Behar. I know that name. Do I know that name? Do I know that name? Maybe not. She, <laughs> I'm not. she wrote it. It was a kids' book. She did. I do have a young kid. Maybe that's. Um, it's like, oh gosh, what grade? Like maybe like around third or fourth grade. Oh. It's called Letters from Cuba that she was doing. Oh, I do know that book. I do know that book. Interesting. How's the weather for you guys? Oh my God. It's beautiful here in New York. It's like 70 ish. I just went outside. My husband was in a short t shirt raking. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Maybe we should decorate for Christmas now before it gets cold. <laughs> yeah, it's so nice. How we have forgot how far is Toledo from Cleveland? Two hours. Two hours. My my dad's from Cleveland, and I've spent oh, okay. a lot of time in Cleveland. Yeah, and yeah. I, we still have some good friends over there, and his brother lives in Columbus. Okay, that's about two hours and fifteen minutes. So are you guys like a triangle then? Because isn't I think Cleveland and Columbus are like two hours from each other. Yeah, yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. My husband used to commute to Cleveland, as odd as that sounds, because um, <laughs> their one main office that he works for is in Cleveland. So he used to drive there all the time. So. Oh, very nice. All right. And um, Lauren knows to be here at 1.30, right? So, I thought she did, but. <laughs> maybe we can message her in a couple minutes if she doesn't show up. Just to make sure we have enough time. Let's see. Where is she located? Do we know? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I don't Do you have her number in case we need a messenger? I don't. Uh, yeah, I might have her phone number. I have to look it up. I think I might have it too. Let me see. So I have. 22 people registered so okay well this is better timing than uh i did one last night that was like right during biden's speech oh and they definitely have like half the number of people i think they were expecting i'm surprised they even had that amount even he apologized yeah. for like that he was doing the event during it <laughs> that's pretty funny oh yeah because i mean how did any of us know i had one thursday night and we only had one person that was like oh my god i missed it we got too wrapped up in the the election stuff yeah and nothing had really happened yet so i'm like what are they all wrapped up in like <laughs> i watched it well, later i was walking down like, the street and it's just every apartment you see in is just tvs on with a map yeah my daughter's um works for an assisted living community and she said yesterday morning at like 11 30 when they made the announcement she said everyone just <laughs> started cheering and screaming and yelling and that's I'm like, funny. all the old people? And she's like, oh, yeah, they went nuts. <laughs> That's good. Very good. Um, yeah, so do I think maybe we should message her. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't find her number. All right, let In me, my... oop, wrong thing. Let me go this way. <sighs> no, 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 no. Let me find it. list which list Come on. i could never remember which what she called the list <laughs> okay here we go Baum. is she there's nope not baum cumin i'm uh, getting my people mixed up oh she didn't put her phone number in here okay See. Let me see if I can Let find it. Let me go. Let me go back to here. She gave 
That's her stuff. Let me look. All right, here we go. Let's see. Oop, they're answering questions. Here we go. Two zero two. Do you want people to be able to use the chat or no? Uh, yeah, so they can ask questions because I'm going to monitor the chat box and ask her questions. All right. And so you want that to be able to be public? Public and private? Um, you can't make it private only, unfortunately. So you can either I mean, do publicly it or publicly and privately. I might as well um, do public and private. I was, I was just going to say, yeah. Then, because you could tell them just to message you. Oh, and that okay. way everyone won't see the questions. Okay, just text her. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. Doo -doo -doo. So once everyone's in, I'm going to disable the waiting room, which mm -hmm. means that if someone else happened to have the link, they would just come right in. It's not gonna, they want, there wouldn't be a waiting room because we're gonna be in the middle of it. Is that okay? Oh, okay, okay. Oh okay. yeah, cause. Or I can um, lock it. I can lock it so no one else can come in. If you, if we have everyone, just let me know and if you want, I can lock it. Okay, cause I don't think I'd wanna lock it cause I, I know sometimes people, they're very late sometimes. Okay. Um, But well, I know it can be distracting if Laura's a, a co-host and there's, you know, pop-ups that exactly. people are you know joining so yeah oh she's gonna hop on in a minute okay um i'm trying to think if there's anything else i need to ask so you, wait is it i forgot it's you that's gonna do the introduction or it's renee no no it's, uh, um, sue sue okay sue, sue. sue and we're also waiting for her right is she do you know where she is um i don't know if she's gonna join very early okay um, we'd like her before too if possible just so i can make sure that everything works yeah she's usually one of my early ducks so. okay and she knows what to, i mean she's done this kind of thing before she's um she's been on the zooms before okay. um that's why i'm leery about making my committee members co-hosts just because they we made one earlier and we we had the breakout rooms right this morning okay and my one i was like what is going on with my screen like why is my screen going wonky and i couldn't figure out all of a sudden it says judy weinberg sharing her screen and i'm like texting her i'm like judy quit sharing your screen and she's <laughs> like i don't know what i did and so thankfully i was a co-host so i could get in and like disable that <laughs> like gotcha. stop sharing your screen <laughs> that's funny it was so <laughs> weird i'm like what is going on right now <laughs> how many people did you guys have this morning uh, including all the authors, 47. Good. Very nice. Is this the last one of the day? Or are you guys doing more after no, this? No, I got another one at 7.30. Got it. Keep them busy. And then I have two tomorrow, and then I have three on Tuesday, and then I have two on Wednesday, and then I have two on Thursday. And if I don't test positive for COVID tomorrow morning, I have shoulder surgery on Friday. Oh, wow. Oh, man. Busy, busy week for you. Yes. Wow. Yes. Oh, well, hope you get to go outside at least a little bit during. The yeah, good that's weather. why I just walked out to bug my husband while he was raking. <laughs> yeah, my wife and son are out in the park right now for a picnic. It looks very nice. So out. nice. Yeah. The, she sent me a video. They're listening to some like samba band. He's three oh, and he's cool. just going like this, like back and forth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay, here Renee. we go. Here's Renee. Oh, oh there's oh, two people. Oh, and Laura. All right. Okay. Admit. I hit admit. Oh, okay. That's to admit. Okay. Uh, two. Okay. Okay. Are we good? Hello. <laughs> I see you. Uh, how about the wait, the video? Uh, we're trying to move it. Well, 
This is like doing this in my kitchen is really crazy. <laughs> How are we? Good. How are you? Good. Okay. Oh, that I, looks I, good. I Very good. Cordless mic on. So is this working? Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, fantastic. I love it. It looks really good. Perfect. Okay. So wait, I just have one more thing. I have to get ready for the. Okay. Oh, can you see? I see the bowl and like half of what's in front of it, like half an apple, half an onion. Yeah, I I'm mean, sure I'm just gonna have to look oh. things up. Wait, wait, wait. No, you cut off my head. I yeah, think... let's keep your head in for. Yeah, one <laughs> move it, move it toward me, and up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'll just move things up. I'll just like, is my head cut off now? I think it's okay. A little bit, a little bit. A cut. little, little top of the head. Put, push it back a little bit. Yeah, there. Okay. There you go. My head has appeared. Your head, perfect. Right. Okay, hold so, on. I'm going to get okay. the completed emergency salad. All right. All right. And Renee, wait, are you speaking certainly at all or no? You're I just... am not speaking at all. I am just taking attendance and then I may slightly disappear. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. I've got attendance list too, Renee. Okay, good, because my computer has decided to die. Mm -hmm. How many people oh, do we have? I believe, Stephanie, didn't you say 22 are signed up? I'm yes, sorry? 22. 22. 22. Nice. Okay. Um, so, Laura, this must be a pretty exciting day to be talking about your book. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, yesterday, we I live in D.C., and I went to sort of um, a big intersection. I mean, it was insane. Yeah. It, it was really wonderful. And my son and his husband live in Philly, and they sent us pictures of – you know, everybody masked, going, parading in the streets. It was. Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. It's the same. Oh yeah, where are you in Brooklyn? My brother's in Park Slope. I'm near Park Slope. I'm in Carroll Gardens. Oh, so it's not far. You no, know, well, I I used to live in on the Upper West Side. So. Oh, cool. Very nice. <laughs> it's a beautiful day here today. It's very oh, nice. wonderful. Okay, so it's a beautiful day here. Um, it's a beautiful day here guide, too. <laughs> do not go anywhere because, like. If there's like okay. a major, okay. <laughs> All right. So can I'm gonna go through since we have about 12 minutes. Do you mind if I start okay. going over some tech stuff with you, Laura? Great. Basic stuff. You look good, sound good. The main things we want to go over are um, if you have stuff like air conditioning and stuff like that, we kind of want that off because it oh. can. All right. Um, we want almost everything off Wi-Fi, if possible, except for what is needed because. You know, we want to keep your connection as good as possible. Yeah. So phones, any other computers that are not involved with, you know, the making of this happen, we would love right. to be off Wi-Fi. Um, and also, like, sometimes you do sound good. You know, sometimes those mics can get rustly because they're on you. Um, so we're going to keep with it. But just to let you know, I might, if, 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 if I'm hearing a lot of rustling, like, maybe move a little bit of how you would be. All right. It sounds fine. Okay, because sometimes okay. we get weird things when people have the mics on them, but it sounds very good. Um, your lighting is good. Um, I'm reading over your, um, you know, the outline that you sent us, and I just have a couple questions really quickly. Sure. Um, in the beginning, you said intro. Thanks for inviting me. How we'll spend our time together. Is that you talking to the people, or is that intro you talking to me? No, that's that's me talking, and then you put on the video. Okay, so you will talk before the video. Yes. Right. And I'll, okay. you know what? I'll actually say like, you know. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You just tell me because this is meeting mode too. Like I'm not, you know, I'm going to spotlight you, but because it's meeting mode, people can actually do whatever they want. They can do gallery speaker view, but I'm okay. going to spotlight you. But yeah, you just let me know when you want me to do a video, the two videos and those um, three pictures in a row. And then later the other picture and just, you just give me a heads up and I will um, screen share them. And right. for the, um, for the three photos, do you want to give me um, like a notification of when you want me to skip ahead to the next photo? Like, are you talking during the photos? I'm talking during the photos, but I can, you know, it's informal enough that I can say, hey, Matt, next photo, or hey, Matt, yeah. next image, yeah. you know. Exactly, perfect. My name is Ethan, but don't worry, I didn't Ethan, put it on. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. I'm sure you're, you're probably working with a bunch of people. It's all good. No worries. But I have put my name as um, Toledo just so that when it screen shares, that's what it says. Um, okay. 
But yeah, and Laura, we're going to Laura, we have one of our committee members doing an introduction for you. Okay. And then then we'll go into and then we'll right. kick off you. We have our first person in the waiting room. So I'm assuming Susan. Oh, that's Rich. she. Hey, there we go. She what? is the committee I should person. Let her. So I'm letting her. In. That's Sue. That's right? Sue. That's okay. yeah. I that's Sue. Hold on. I'm just going to check to make sure I have no phones in this room. All right. Perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone mute your phones. Oh, yeah, here. Um, Stephanie, I will make Sue. She's not, there's no outros, right? Is there any outro after everything is done? Well, I'm not um, bye or anything? I'm, I, I'll am i probably do something, okay. yeah. So my, I will make thoughts. Susan a host for now, but then I can okay. make her un, un okay. host there after she's okay. Just so that she can um, more easily mute and unmute herself. Sue, we need you to, yes, yeah, so we can see you. I could actually get a spoon if I'm going to taste this emergency. So time. since you're doing the intro, um, Ethan's going to work with you here in a second to kind of square up your screen and check your audio and stuff. But we're working with Laura right this second. OK, I'll just wait patiently. Sorry, okay. actually, my spot just Laura. died. So now I'm, <laughs> I'm I thought Laura. I had charged it, but I guess I had um, a rich Rusco. Yeah, Rich can wait. We just create right. the Does anyone, he, everyone else is waiting. waiting, right? Everyone else is waiting. Perfect, perfect. Tell Big I R agree to be that patient, Rich Renee. Rusko can wait. Tell tell Rich to, to wait a minute. Rich <laughs> Rusko, you need to wait a minute. <laughs> she goes, fine, be that way, people. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Kev. Uh, he's gone. <laughs> uh oh. I told him to stay around in case you did. Gone. We but, saw you. You have witnesses. Oh, well. And, you know, the thing that's weird is that it's actually smelling a lot like emergency salad right now <laughs> apples and onions. <laughs> so we'll be fine. Are we doing, so we are doing a QA at the end, right? Is that correct? Yeah, Stephanie? Laura, do you want me to watch the chat box and then at the end do the Q&A and I can just ask you the questions that have popped up in the chat box? Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, you just, when you, you're you doing it after the demonstration, right? The Q&A would be after the demonstration? Right. First, okay. I'm going to do a sort of a half an hour talk yep. with the two videos and the stills. Then I'm going to do the demonstration and then um, Q and A. Perfect. Okay. And then after the Q and A, Stephanie, you said you want to just a yeah, me? quick thank you and okay. All so right now, stuff. the people that are in here, you guys are the only ones that can unmute yourself. So no one's going to be able to talk or anything. We are the only people that can do that. So okay. if that, like when you think either Laura, you say I'm done, or when it seems like you're done, Stephanie, if you want to unmute yourself and turn your video on, okay, do that. Um, as you were saying, it's pretty informal. So like I will be watching, but there's really only the five of you that we're really dealing with. And Renee said she's not speaking at all. And Sue, you were just doing an intro, I believe. Um, so right. really it's just after Sue is done, it's really just Laura and then Stephanie at the end and thumbs up. <laughs> um, Great. I'm going to go up for one second. That's fine. To um, inform a certain person about getting off the network. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, could you and then, so yeah, um, Stephanie, just as a heads up, uh -huh. okay. just in case someone is trying to get in while I'm screen sharing, I can't do that. So if you, nope, want to I've let got it. In, then yep, no will be good. Judy's gonna wait. Yeah, they can all wait right now until we're all ready to go. Perfect. Sounds good. Cool. All right. These are the days when I ruin not having a white countertop. Oh, <laughs> it should be a lot easier, but you know. Whatever. It'll go great. <laughs> It'll be fun. But there are a lot of things that one would have done if one thought when we <laughs> quarantined. <laughs> the, they were going to be quarantined you know, and doing Zoom meetings. <laughs> it's working out great. Everyone's loving them. So it's a great opportunity for us to bring really wonderful people to our community. So we say thank you in advance. Wonderful. Well, that's, you know, it's a beautiful day. For many reasons, including <laughs> many, many, many reasons. Right. Many. So we have three people in the waiting room now. Four, four people. Renee, who would be Ben? 
Is there a last name to Ben? No. no. Um, I can't remember. You can actually, I think you can message him if you want, or if you want me to. I mean, I guess we could wait and see if they pop up their video and we can see who they are. Well, you can, they have a screen grab. Oh. It's hard to tell, but. Uh, Jody Goldstein would not be Ben. She would be Marshall. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess once we get close to the number of people, maybe you would be able to tell. I mean, unless I forgot to put somebody down, but. Uh, there's only like two names I don't know on here. So it could be one of those two names. So I'm doing this from my iPad, so I don't see necessarily the same way as you do on a computer screen. Right. Yeah. Hey, Ethan, you know, this microphone comes from B&H. Ah, I love it. Which is one of my favorite places. It really is amazing. I would say I probably have 20 different things from B&H. My office under normal times is pretty, is walking distance from there. Well, well I'm going to go ahead and start letting people in since we've got about three minutes. Okay, well, hold on one sec before, right before we, you let them in. So uh -huh. just everyone unmute. I mean, keep yourselves muted and have your video off when um, you're not supposed to be speaking. So Laura, obviously you can stay on for now, but Renee, I would turn off your video probably. And Stephanie, it's up to you. Um, and then Sue, you are just ready to go. So you're going to lead it. Um, Stephanie, whenever you want Sue to lead, you can tell Sue. Okay. Stephanie. Okay. I'll welcome everybody and then um, introduce Sue. Sue, you do the intro, which introduces Laura, and then she goes into it. Great. All righty. Ready, set, break. <laughs> huddle. Do our huddle. All right. But we're waiting to start right until people. Yeah. Usually takes about till about five after. Okay, cool. Do you want me to have Sue spotlight right now since she's the first person? Uh, I don't All right, I'm gonna let you admit everyone since you know the names. Because I see other people, okay. I'm on it. All right. I did put on makeup and a real shirt. <laughs> hey, you got me in lipstick, which is. <laughs>
we'll give it a couple more minutes to have everybody join us and then we'll get started. All right, everybody, I'd like you to welcome you to our Sunday afternoon um, book festival event um, featuring Laura Kuman. So we are very excited to have her in live from Washington, D.C. So just as a reminder, everybody is muted and um, so we kind of eliminate all the background noise. So if you have any questions, we're going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. So if you want to put any of your questions in the chat box, you can either send them to me, Stephanie, privately, or you can put it in for the group as a whole. Um, and then I will be going through them and asking um, them of Laura at the end of her presentation. So um, if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the chat box. And um, to get us started, I'd like to welcome one of our committee members, Sue Richards, who will be doing Laura's introduction. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Welcome to the 16th annual Northwest Ohio Jewish Book Festival. We are delighted to have so many of you join us and to thank the Jewish Federation and Foundation of Greater Toledo for their generous support of these programs. In celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, Laura Kuman, in her wonderful book, All Stirred Up, Suffrage Cookbooks, Food, and the Battle for Women's Right to Vote, shares the storied history of the women's suffrage movement adding new and delicious information about an aspect of the movement strategy that is not well known. The ingenious use of food to reach out to people in a non-threatening and accessible way while providing them with information and gently nudging them to support women's suffrage. In, a, in addition to writing All Stirred Up, Laura Kuman is an attorney has also written another cookbook, The Hamilton Cookbook, runs a food blog, Mother Would Know, and teaches cooking and food history in Washington, DC. Laura Kuman and her husband live in the DC area 
and have two adult children. It is my pleasure to welcome and present Laura Kuman. Thank you so much. And really, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm delighted to be with you. I only wish it could be in person, but we're here in my kitchen and maybe in yours. So that's pretty good. Anyway, I'd like to give you a little bit of a preview of what we're gonna do. The first thing we're gonna do is really, I'm gonna talk a little bit about suffrage from my point of view, which is um, a little bit maybe unique. Uh, then we'll talk specifically about suffrage in food, um, specifically the suffrage cookbooks. Um, third, we're gonna do a little bit of a demonstration and you can cook along with me. We're gonna make emergency salad. And finally, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, we're gonna do a Q and A. So come on along and hear about suffrage and uh, enjoy suffrage, suffrage cookbook uh, recipes. Take care and let's get started with an overview. Ethan, there's a little two videos. This is the first. They wouldn't let us vote. We outsmarted them. Now let's eat. Hi, I'm Laura Kuman, author of All Stirred Up, Suffrage Cookbooks, Food, and the Battle for Women's Right to Vote. There's an old joke that says that every Jewish holiday has the same theme. They tried to kill us, we survived, now let's eat. My take on women's suffrage is similar. They would let us vote, we outsmarted them, now let's eat. Suffragists figured out that food wasn't just the key to a man's heart, it was the key to winning the right to vote. This is the story of the forgotten suffragists. Not the women who picketed, but the ones who went door to door peddling suffrage with a cookbook under their arms. They sold that idea to people who might have otherwise hesitated to open the door, but couldn't resist a nice bowl of steaming hot soup or a tasty cookie. I'll bet you didn't even know there were suffrage cookbooks. I didn't either until I uncovered the amazing story of the women who fought for a voice in our democracy with recipes and rolled jelly cake. The idea for the suffrage battle was hatched way back in 1848, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and a few other women gathered for tea near Seneca Falls, New York. In their world, it was legal for a man to beat his wife, a woman could be arrested for trying to vote, and thousands of children died from contaminated milk. It would be more than 70 years, with a civil war and world war in between, from that first meeting until the ratification of the 19th Amendment at the start of the Roaring Twenties. Millions of American women and men battled for women's right to vote. In All Stirred Up, you'll find out how they fought and won, using food as a tactic to persuade the nation. Then let's celebrate the 100th anniversary of the victory with food made from suffrage cookbook recipes. Enjoy reading the original recipes and cooking from the adapted versions that I've created for your modern taste and convenience. And don't forget, the best way to celebrate the suffrage victory is to vote. My perspective on the suffrage movement really begins with an important fact that I think it's often gets lost which is that the suffragists really had to convince men to vote for suffrage. It wasn't just about mobilizing women, but it was about convincing men. After all, in order to change either the state laws or the federal constitution, they needed the voters. And who were the voters? Well, the voters were men. Now, if we begin at the beginning of the battle, um, most historians call the beginning of the organized suffrage movement uh, the Seneca Falls Convention. So at the convention, there were a lot of women's rights uh, discussions and a lot of subjects. Women had very few rights in those days. The question was, why begin with voting? And the answer, maybe ironically, is that it is really due to a man. It's really due to Frederick Douglass, who was the person who stood up at the Seneca Falls Convention when all of the other resolutions were set to pass unanimously, but not suffrage. And Frederick Douglass was the one who spoke up and said, 
Suffrage is what we have to fight for and suffrage is really important. And so suffrage became the issue. Well, if you look at my book, you'll see that there's a timeline of what else was going on. And you'll see that in this 70 plus year battle, there was a lot else going on in the world, in the US. I mean, think about it. The beginning of the suffrage battle, of course, was immediately prior to the Civil War. And then there was the Civil War. Well, suffrage kind of stopped. Um, before that time, there was really no organized suffrage movement. There were no um, there, there were no organizations that promoted suffrage as their main cause. Um, there were some suffrage meetings. And in fact, if you heard of Sojourner Truth's famous Ain't I a Woman speech, well, that comes from one of those early suffrage uh, meetings. But that speech is a good example of what happened in suffrage history and in history in general, which is that Sojourner Truth's first language was actually Dutch and she spoke English quite well. She would not have said, ain't I a woman? That was a transcription done about a decade later by a suffragist. And you know, it really uh, may have sounded good to the white suffragists who were interested in reading about it, but it really wasn't true, so turn her truth talking. In any event, after the Civil War, the suffragists got together and they started to create organizations. Well, as soon as they created those organizations, they began to really have internal strife about where should the movement really put most of its effort. Some people thought they should go state by state. Others thought that they should really fight for a constitu federal constitutional amendment. Now, we all know how that ended up, but it was a long time in coming. And I wanna really explain what a long time in coming means with um, some statistics. It's not really, it's not important to remember the numbers, but just think about this. This is Carrie Chapman Catt, the head of the mainstream suffrage organization when in fact the 19th amendment was passed, who with her co-author went through in the 1920s and cataloged how many battles. She found that there were 56 referenda campaign during the 70 plus years. There were 480 campaigns to urge legislatures to submit suffrage to the people, to voters. Well, people meaning the male voters. There were 47 campaigns to induce state constitutional conventions to add women's suffrage to their state constitutions. Some did, most did not. And there were 277 campaigns to persuade state party conventions to include women's suffrage in their party platforms. Well, that's not even the end. There were 30 campaigns to, see, to urge the national political parties to include suffrage in their campaign platforms. And finally, there were 19 campaigns in 19 successive Congresses to introduce suffrage as a constitutional amendment. So who were the women, who were the suffragists? Well, first of all, they were members of organizations. The leaders of the organizations were typically middle-class and upper-middle-class white women. And that was in fact the bulk of who was in the suffrage organizations. There were also famous suffragists. Now, these were not just people we think of as suffragists like Susan B. Anthony, but there were other people who were quite famous at the time and who lent their voices to suffrage. Uh, one of them was the author and uh, uh, expert explorer, I guess you'd call him, Jack London. I loved Jack London books as a kid and he was a, a suffrage supporter, which brings up the men. Well, today we would call them allies, but in those days there was a suffragist named Vita Sutton who coined the term suffragettes. And these were gentlemen who took it upon themselves to promote the suffrage cause, often in ways that the suffra women suffragists themselves couldn't do. So for example, in New York, there was a group of suffragettes who formed an organization and who were rich and they were by and large quite powerful 
And they spoke to the other rich and powerful men who owned newspapers, who were in government. These were people that the suffragists didn't really have access to. And finally, who there is this very large group, the women I really care about, who I call the forgotten suffragists. Now, these were the women who really were, there were hundreds of thousands of them, maybe millions of them, and they fought for suffrage, but in very quiet ways often. They were into convincing, not challenging, and they were, in fact, the women who put together the suffrage cookbooks. This uh, suffrage group was very diverse. Um, in fact, there were many women in the suffrage movement who were not middle class or upper middle class and who were not white. Uh, there were many black suffragists, but the movement was like society at the time, quite racist. And those black suffragists typically had to form their own organizations. They found it very difficult to be part of mainstream organizations. In addition, there were immigrants. You know, we think of uh, the suffragists, if you know just a little bit about the movement, as being very xenophobic, very anti-immigrant. Well, there were some suffrage leaders who were. But in fact, the suffragists and the suffrage movement in some places welcomed immigrants. And there were some immigrant groups that were quite supportive of suffrage. And I'm pleased to say that one of those groups was the uh, Jewish immigrant population of New York City. There's a sociologist who did a very, very detailed study of an, voting in New York on a suffrage uh, referendum. And she discovered that, for example, the, the, the Jewish Lower East Side population was very active in the suffrage movement. Well, that was surprising to me. And then, of course, there were the unlikely collaborators and those were um, people and organizations who found that they had common cause with the suffragists. One of the common, uh, very well-known collaborations was between the suffrage movement and the temperance movement, because many of these suffragists actually believed in temperance or prohibiting alcohol. If you look at the timeline in my book, this is also the time of prohibition. So, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded by the suffragists. So who is opposed to suffrage? Well, for me, if any of you know that, that gif of the exploding head, <laughs> I laugh, but you know, I had really stereotypes about who the aunties would be. And when I discovered who they really were, I had to lose some of those stereotypes because a large group of the aunties were women. And not only were they women, but they were women who were in many other ways quite progressive about suffrage. Oh, I'm sorry, about women's rights. They were not progressive about suffrage. Um, but I'll give you an example. The founder of the main anti-suffrage organization was a woman named Josephine Jewell Dodge. Well, she was also the founder of a number of day nurseries for working women so that their children could be cared for while they worked. She was also the founder of several organizations for day nurseries. Now that's not a cause you would expect somebody who was uh, opposed to suffrage perhaps to uh, be also involved in. Other aunties, well, uh, how about Catherine Beecher, the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe? Now she was never married. She was a very well-known author of the time. She believed in women's education, but she didn't believe in women voting. And in the Jewish sphere, there was a woman named Annie Meyer Nathan. Annie Nathan Meyer, pardon me, I always get the name switched. But in any event, she was actually the founder of Barnard College and she was an auntie. She had quit Columbia because she felt they didn't take women's education seriously. And so she founded Barnard. Well, she clearly cared about women's education, but she also did not believe that women should vote. Not only did she care about women's education, but she actually broke the color barrier at her own school at Barnard by giving Zora Neale Hurston, the famous black author and playwright, 
she gave Zora Neale Hurston tuition to go to Barnard. Well, she was an auntie. There were some organizations that were aunties too. The liquor lobby, you know, if the temperance people were gonna be pro-suffrage, the liquor lobby was gonna be anti, of course. And then there were the political machines. In many cities, the political machines really wanted to make sure that they knew how people were gonna vote. How men were gonna vote, they knew, but how women were gonna vote, they weren't so sure. So they were opposed to women's suffrage. So suffrage was controversial and like some political subjects today, it really divided families. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the the women who I like, the women, the, the forgotten suffragists. And I want to begin with a quote from uh, one of my heroes, who's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And this is a quote that Alex Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindeman, who knows something about standing up for what you believe. It's a quote that he tweeted soon after Justice Ginsburg died. She said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Well, that's what the suffragists did. And particularly that's what the forgotten suffragists did. There was 70 some years of grit, hard work, grassroots organizing and a lot of political savvy and they went everywhere. Ethan, how about that first picture? Now this is suffragists really walking on a dirt road and being offered a ride by a, a guy in a, a horse and buggy. If you think about it, suffrage, the main part of the suffrage battle took place before there were automobiles, certainly before most people had them. And the suffragists went everywhere. They went into big cities and small cities, small towns and on the rural roads. And then they were great marketers. You know, today we look at people we call influencers. I mean, if you think of LeBron James, you think of uh, famous athletic stars. Well, in those days, they had influencers too. And one of them in favor of the suffrage cause was Clara Barton. And we have uh, really a, a wonderful quote from Clara Barton who was, in fact, as we all know, the angel of the battlefield. She was a Civil War nurse. She founded the American Red Cross and she was also a very firm suffragist. Well, she spoke to the men of this country and she said, when you were weak and I was strong, I toiled for you. Now you are strong and I am weak. Because of my work for you, I ask your aid. I ask the ballot for myself and my sex, as I stood by you, I pray you stand by me and mine. Well, Clara Barton saying that to someone who, to a man who had been a soldier, who knew about the work of her work in the Red Cross, her work in the Civil War, that was powerful stuff. Well, they also like to use memes and campaigns that would make a modern, uh, political strategists sit up and take notice. You know, the Lincoln Project wasn't the first on this score. And uh, they, they had some very wonderful little uh, ideas. For example, suffrage QPs. Have you ever seen a QP? I had, but I had no idea that they began with the suffrage movement. Isn't that adorable? And they use cat memes too. If it was cute, they used it. So, what were the last minutes of the suffrage battle? Well, you may have heard that the last state to ratify the 19th Amendment before it became a part of the Constitution was Tennessee. And that's certainly true. And that's the story of one legislator, Harry Byrne, who went into the, the special session of the legislature wearing the red rose of the anti-movement. But in his pocket, he had tucked away a letter from his mom who said, Harry, be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. Remember Mrs. Cat? She was the leader of the mainstream suffrage movement at the time. And she was there. She was in Tennessee and she was trying to pass suffrage. Well, 
Harry did help his help Mrs. Cat, and he paid attention to what his mom said. You know, we all celebrate this. We celebrate this as the centennial, the 100th anniversary. It was August of 1920 when that happened in Tennessee. But I'm a lawyer, and you know what? I found out that, in fact, if you really want to be technical about it, the centennial will not be for two more years because it was not until 1922 that the Supreme Court issued a decision, Justice Brandeis, in a case saying that the ratification of the 19th Amendment had been valid. As soon as Tennessee had voted for ratification, the anti-forces filed suit and they fought for two years. Well, they fought for two years and finally the 19th Amendment, there was just no question, it was valid. But you know what, that was really not the end of the story for a lot of women and particularly for women of color as you, you recognize, and as we talk a lot about today, it wasn't until the Voting Rights Acts of the 1960s, and it wasn't until even today uh, that we have to go back and revisit some of the voter suppression tactics and how to fight them. And of course, I live in DC where we still don't have representation. <laughs> but what does suffrage mean for us? Well. It means that it's a settled issue. Women do, it is settled, it's not an issue. Women have the right to vote. It's also what we call a hinge in history. And uh, that means that really there was a lot that happened after that. There was a lot that happened and that would not have happened, but for voting. So let's talk about the role of food in suffrage. Why food? Well. Ethan has an anti-cartoon. Let me show it to you for a second. This is what the antis were saying. Women who believed in suffrage would leave their men, hated families, hated cooking. They weren't domestic. That was, they were, they were angry women, according to the antis. Well, food is really a common denominator. It's common ground. You know, everybody has to eat and most people like to eat food that tastes good. So, you know, the suffragists, the forgotten suffragists used food as a way of explaining that they were not anti-family, they were not anti-domestic uh, chores, and they knew how to cook. So they used food at every step of the way. They had farmers who were suffragists who raised food. There were suffrage grocery stores. There were suffrage lunchrooms and there were cookbooks. So let's talk a little bit about the suffrage cookbooks, but first um, a video. Ah, uh, the sweet taste of suffrage. Human, author of All Stirred Up, Suffrage Cookbooks, Food, and the Battle for Women's Right to Vote. The Battle for Women's Right to Vote took over 70 years. The army of supporters needed money to fund their cause and a way to begin conversations, to get folks to open their doors and their minds to the radical proposition that women should be able to vote in every election that men could vote in. That's where suffrage cookbooks came in. You won't learn about suffrage cookbooks from most other accounts of the fight for women's suffrage. I had never heard of them myself until I happened upon one of these amazing cookbooks and dug into the story of the trailblazing women who helped convince a nation with hot cross buns and Boston fish chowder. We'll never know how many suffrage cookbooks there were. We only know of those that have survived, fewer than 10 today but there are tantalizing hints of several others now lost to us. The surviving suffrage cookbooks begin with a slim volume created in Boston in the 1880s. This cookbook includes three recipes for Washington pie, a protest against pepper, and directions for nine different types of disinfectants. Suffragists in Rockford, Illinois, put together the holiday gift cookbook a few years later. 
The largest suffrage cookbook is from Washington State, where suffrage has put together one with hundreds of recipes. At the opposite end in terms of size, an organization of women household workers collaborated with the Women's City Club of Long Beach, California, to publish a sweet pamphlet called Little Taste of Enfranchisement that runs less than 20 pages. The latest suffrage cookbook we know of comes from the women of Wayne County, Michigan, and it includes a recipe for a 15-pound wedding cake. In All Stirred Up, I'll tell you more about these fascinating cookbooks and how suffragists use food to win over the nation. Then celebrate women's right to vote with treats made from suffrage cookbook recipes, including one of my favorites, soft gingerbread made with sour cream. Suffrage cookbooks really did have two purposes. They were good fundraisers. Uh, any of you who have ever done a cookbook for your temple or for a kid's school, you know they can work very well as fundraisers. They're also marketing tools. They were marketing tools because they brought in a lot of different kinds of people. First were the people who contributed the recipes. Then there were the people who sold the cookbooks door to door. Sometimes they gave them away, but often they sold them. They brought in those who, who bought the books and they brought in those who ate the recipe, who ate the food made from the recipes. Well, you know, suffrage cookbooks were community cookbooks. And that meant that they were really a part of a movement which began after the Civil War in the United States. And today we know all about community cookbooks. We have lots of them. Um, I think particularly of one community cookbook that I really had not described to myself and my friends as community, but it is, which is the Settlement Cookbook. That was started by a woman who wanted to give, she was working in a settlement house and she wanted to give the women who were the settlement house um, clients a way to know about the recipes of America. She created this cookbook. Her name is Elizabeth Cander Black and it became one of the most successful cookbooks of all time in the United States. It's right up there with Julia Child. Well, it was also part, the suffrage cookbooks are part of and really are enmeshed in the movement that was going on in of food in that time, which in the old days they used to call domestic science. When I was going to, cup, to high school, it was called home ec. And what were the home ec food rules? Well, the food rules were, it should be sauced, it should be preferably white. Uh, it was typically to our taste overcooked and under flavored. And finally, it was, if it, if it came from another country, it had to be an Americanized version. So, you know, I put one of those recipes in the book, an Americanized version of, some, of something that uh, I guess had been eaten and believed to be from Mexico. But honestly, Mexican noodles, I don't see anything Mexican about them. And they certainly don't taste Mexican to me. What kinds of recipes did I include? Well. As the video said, there are fewer than 10 existing suffrage cookbooks. And I tried to take different types of recipes from each of the cookbooks. Um, some that we would know about, um, certainly, you know, there are brownies, there's gingerbread, there's potato salad. Um, but there were a few others that I didn't really know about and that turned out to be very popular during suffrage time. Uh, one of those, for example, was Sally Lundbread. I don't know, I've never heard of it, but uh, it turns out that it's, uh, it was very popular during suffrage time. And there were a few, of course, like the Mexican noodles that represented um, called other cultures. And this was the suffrage cookbook uh, version of those cultures. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about one cookbook in particular, which is the one from Pittsburgh. In 1915, a woman named L. O. Kleber put together a suffrage cookbook that has, or very unusual for the suffrage cookbooks, it has a couple of recipes that are not really for making food, they're food for thought. And 
One of them is called Pie for Suffragist Doubting Husband. It has only two ingredients. The first is one quart of the milk of human kindness. And the second is eight reasons. And those eight reasons are war, white slavery, child labor, eight million working women, bad roads, poisonous water, and impure food. Well, the directions are just two sentences. Mix the crust with tact and velvet gloves using no sarcasm, especially with the upper crust. Upper crust must be handled with extreme care for they quickly sour if manipulated roughly. And now let's turn to a suffrage cookbook recipe that you can make. Uh, maybe some of you are making it along with me. It's called emergency salad. Why did I pick this one? Well, for two reasons. First reason, it was kind of a thing in that day. And if you watch food shows on TV or you read food blogs, you know that there are certain recipes that are kind of a thing these days, like sheet pan dinners. A couple of years ago, it was cupcakes. A few years ago, it was like things made with kale. Well, emergency salad was a thing in those days. Here it is. Okay. And the second reason I chose it was because when I started making it and I started thinking about how to adapt it, I discovered that it was really something that had great resonance for me as a Jewish person. And that's because really, I mean, it's savory corrosive. Sweet a little bit, but mostly savory. So let's look at the recipe. Uh, I think you got the recipe ahead of time. And it comes from the Washington Women's Cookbook, which is a 1909 cookbook that was uh, quite a success. The original recipe is just literally one sentence. Use chopped apples and onions, one tenth onions and nine tenths apples served with any salad dressing. Well, you know, that sounds like a recipe my grandmother would have given me. A bissel of this, a little of that, do it this way, maybe not. Mix it till it's done. You know, her 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 belief in what temperature to, to put something into the oven at was a hot oven. Well, I tried to take this and I turned it into a, a recipe with a little bit more direction. Um, I turned it into a vinaigrette from any salad dressing. And I explained that you should use a red onion or a Vidalia onion. Um, Red onion, Vidalia onion. Now, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with sweet onions, the way you can tell them in the store, they do look like yellow onions, but in fact, they're usually flat and um, often they have a tag on them, but it's the flat shape that really makes it clear it's a sweet onion. So what I did was I don't really love the taste of raw onion, but I do love a particular salad that Ina Garten makes. And it's a watermelon salad with uh, onion, with red onion. And one of the things that she suggests is that if you marinate the onion with lime juice, it will actually take the sharpness off the onion. So I did that. And after you chop the apple, I had to chop my apples ahead of time. Uh, but, you know, here they are, chopped apples. You throw in the lime juice and you let it sit while you make the other ingredients. Well, you know, that also prevents it from turning. I, I made these apples several hours ago and they're still good. They're not browned. They're not, they look just about the same color they looked when I, when I cut them up. And there's not a lot of um, lime juice in this, but enough. So this is, uh, Oh, you know, I actually, speaking of getting schmutz all over myself, um, I do have my favorite Hanukkah Mart apron here. I don't know about where you are, but around here we have a Hanukkah Mart at my temple and it's where I get basically anything I really like for myself. I just call it a Hanukkah present. So this was one year's Hanukkah present to myself. Um, Anyway, so here you have the apples, which have had the lime juice in them. 
Then all you do is you put in chopped onion. Okay, you add the diced onion, which I have a little bit up here. You can just dice it up as small or as big as you like the pieces. For me, I'm big into smaller, I'm big into small pieces. How does that sound? But you know what I mean. I prefer smaller pieces. So my knife skills are better when no one's watching, but at the moment you can just see, I suggested that you just make a big slice of onion. And for two apples, that works about right. If you are a very um, persnickety person and you like to do things exactly, I suggest a kitchen scale. Um, I did provide weights as well as um, volume measurements. So if you want, instead of, or it's not exactly a volume measurement, but if you want to stay instead of uh, a, a thick slice of onion, if you want to say exactly how many kilograms or ounces, you can, you can do that. Okay, you just add in the chopped onion. And then you add in two tablespoons of olive oil, very simple. Good, 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 good. Two teaspoons of honey. I have to have the absolute cutest little honey bear, which somebody gave me, so I'll use that. And most of you will probably need to do two teaspoons, but I did, I happen to have this crazy measuring thing that I got, which is pretty good for teaspoons. Oh. I don't just get schmutz on myself, I get schmutz on everything. Oh well. And then a light sprinkling of kosher salt. Well, I wanted to show you that I have the generic, which I'll use. But I also have what my grandmother would have called fancy schmancy. It's from France. I got it as a gift. You can use that. It's uh, you want to use uh, salt that's got a, that's a little bit coarser than uh, table salt. And here you go. Now, the best part about emergency salad is that you can eat it right away, but it's also very good if you let it sit. This emergency salad has been sitting for several hours in the refrigerator and it's wonderful. It's better even the second day. The other thing I wanna to mention to you about emergency salad is the kinds of apples to use. I suggest using a variety uh, I don't even know what kind of apples these are, okay? I got them from my CSA, my Community Supported Agriculture box. Uh, they weren't labeled. <laughs> I can't even remember what I ordered, but you know, they're different. So that was good. And uh, you can use whatever you want. The other thing that's really good about this recipe is that it is infinitely variable. Um, I tried to make it with very, very small chopped apples and then apples that were a little bit bigger. You can't really tell the difference, but however you like it. And if you're using it for haroset, which I'm thinking about this year, um, and you want to add like a little something to make it a little bit more like mortar, I suggest very, very finely chopped walnuts. Now it's getting that way. It's going a little bit Ashkenazic. But uh, one of the things that's very nice about this is it really isn't sweet and it doesn't have cinnamon. So if you're at a Seder table and everything else is sweet, this will work. So do we have any questions? Any, anything that you guys would like to know? I do have one question for you. Let me pull it up. I just had it. Um... Let's see. Do you think that food still has any role to play in today's social action movements? I do. I actually, uh, when I was trying to think of a tagline for my website, lauracuman.com, I, I 
decided when I was walking with some friends that the tagline would be food is common ground. Because really, if you sit down with people and you sit down to a meal together, I mean, you're already doing something together. And, you know, I think the recent weeks have proven that, you know, a lot of what's going to, what, what a social movement has to be about is convincing people, bringing people with you and not uh, antagonizing them. Well, you know, hand them a piece of gingerbread or a brownie or get together over some salad. It's, it's going to be a good way to start the conversation. Why is it called emergency salad? <laughs> I have to say that, you know, in the days of home ec, when science was being brought into the home, one of the things that was really important to those first home ec uh, people was the, the, the people who made home ec what it really became, was that you should entertain properly. And the idea of somebody showing up unexpectedly, you would always have an apple and an onion in your house. You know, and I looked at other recipes for emergency salad. They always, they always are just a few ingredients and things that you would have. I mean, in those days, people had cabbage around. And so a lot of the recipes are, you know, cabbage, a little bit of onion, sometimes an apple, a little bit of salad dressing. And, you know, you could put it out nicely. They always plated things very nicely and then they serve it. Uh, one of the reasons I used a red, a red onion instead of a, uh, a Vidalia or a sweet onion is because I just can't bear how white everything was. That was their idea. It should be white or it should be covered in white sauce. What are some of your favorite recipes in, in your book? Well, I chose a few of the recipes I chose because after I had adapted them and made them, I just loved them. And I would say that the gingerbread is amazing. Um, the brownies are great. They're kind of, uh, you know, a an old fashioned brownie, the kind of brownie that we would remember. They're not these humongous thick things. They're, they're small, delicate brownies, the kind I had when I was a kid. Um, the other thing I love is that there's something in there called spatchcock chicken, which is really just, if you know about butterflying chicken, you can even have a butcher do it, you know, just take out the backbone and you spread it out and then you grill it. Well, you could bake it too, but I prefer to grill it and it's, it's delicious. That's all of our questions. Great. Well, you know, I hope that, uh, this, this past couple of weeks has been kind of exhausting for a lot of people, but I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And I think some of the lessons are really um, to be learned from the suffrage movement and not just from recent events. And I would say that there's, my, my takeaway from this is from learning about the suffrage movement is really that, you know, you want to celebrate the, women who are loud, the women who everybody else knows about, but you should really celebrate all of the women in the suffrage movement and the forgotten women, as well as those who are, uh, were the media darlings, because really suffrage was about all women voting. And that's, you know, that's proven to be a very durable lesson over, over time. Well, I would like to thank Laura for joining us from her home in Washington, D.C. and sharing her book with us. Um, if you want to get a copy of her book, it's available at the Barnes & Noble on Monroe Street, or you can order it online. And um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to the Federate Federation and Foundation of Greater Toledo for helping us support the book festival. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone at our future events. So thank you again, Laura, for joining us. Well, thank you. And thanks to the Federation. Take care, everybody. Stay in touch and vote every chance you get.